Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. This lesson, entitled The Law After the Resurrection, is for novices to the law, those that teach novices to the law, and those who are simply searching and seeking for truth and wanting to learn more about uh, biblical law. Many, many have been taught that um, Christ did away with the law, that uh, the law is nailed to the cross, and that believers have absolutely no obligation to keep the law. And uh, some hold slightly more tempered views and um, hold to the doctrine that I believe was originally propounded by the Catholic Church that um, there is a difference between a moral law and a ceremonial law. The moral law typically being um, embodied in the Ten Commandments. And so that sect of believers um, believes that while we have to keep the Ten Commandments, we can do away with all or most of the other laws. And so um, I wanted us to look at scripture, um, look at teachings about the law, specifically the teachings that and the, the actions that occurred after the Messiah was resurrected, because that will give us the best clue as to what we are to do today. If we go back to that early church, if you will. So again, we're embarking on the law after the resurrection, um, subtitled evidence that the disciples continued to keep the law after the Messiah's resurrection and ascension. So delving into it, um, let's turn to Acts chapter 1. This is um, the scene most immediately, well, no, that's not true. It's not immediately after the resurrection, but um, soon thereafter. Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 3. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Yahusha began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive, after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of Yah. Let me quickly pause here, and um, you'll immediately notice I replace the word Jesus with Yahusha and uh, the word God with Yah, and uh, that would be a, an entirely different lesson on the Hebrew names um, that were originally used in the original text and how those have been lost in translation, but if I say Yahusha, I am talking about the Messiah, and if I say Yah, I'm using the um, form of the actual proper name of God, the Creator, that you find in Psalm 68 and verse 4, New King James Version, okay? But that's another lesson. So anyhow, we see here in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, a scene of um, what was going on right after the resurrection. The Messiah was showing himself to his disciples, showing that he was, in fact, alive. And he did this for a period of 40 days. So he didn't just, you know, come out the grave and go straight up to heaven. He took some time to spend with his disciples, and it says right here that he did so for 40 days. And that time period is significant, because if we move on, we'll see why. Continuing on in Acts chapter 1, looking at verses 4 and 5, it says, and being assembled together with them, this is Yahusha the Messiah, he says, um, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Okay, so he's been with them for 40 days. But he says, wait in Jerusalem, because 
in not many days, you are going to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So let's just get that down. 40 days, he's been with them. He's saying, wait a few more days. Not many days from now, you're going to receive a promise. This is, a, this is very significant. Why? Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us why. It says, and I quote, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. First of all, where were they? In Jerusalem, like he said. And it says the day of Pentecost was fully come. Well, Pentecost, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance or really any good Bible dictionary or concordance, you're going to see that Pentecost literally means the 50th day. And what it is, we call it Pentecost now, but it's really um, the Feast of Weeks that you see in the Old Testament, specifically Leviticus 23. Um, it was a 50-day period. So Messiah was with his disciples for 40 days. He told them, wait in Jerusalem for a few more days, and then you will receive the promise. And this was all leading up to the 50th day, which is the day of Pentecost. Okay. Um, looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, here we see they received the promise. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Okay, let's pause right here. Who was there in Jerusalem for Pentecost? I think, I know in past times I've thought it was all types of people. You know, people from different nations, different nationalities, all of that. But it specifically tells you who was there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. It says there were Jews, devout men out of every nation. These were Jews who lived in nations all over the place. And I don't have time now, but perhaps in another study I'll explain, you know, the whole dispersion. Jews had been dispersed. They were living all over. Um, they were in North Africa, Asia, the Middle East, some in Southern Europe, um, what we would now call the Middle East. They were living all over the place, but they were commanded to come to Jerusalem three times a year. And we see that in this next slide. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 6 says, Three times in a year shall all males appear before Yah, thy Elohim, in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. So we see here three times all males, these are Jewish males, had to come to Jerusalem. And one of those times was the Feast of Weeks. Well, the Feast of Weeks, as I was explaining earlier, is just another um, word for or phrase for Pentecost. That's what they're talking about there. When you say Feast of Weeks, you're talking about Pentecost. It's called a Feast of Weeks because one was to count a seven-week period plus a day, or um, it, it actually says seven Sabbaths shall you count. Um, plus one day, and that's how you got to the 50th day, which is Pentecost. So the reason you see all these Jews, these devout men from every nation under heaven in Jerusalem, is they were actually being obedient to the law, and they were there for Pentecost. And the Messiah was telling his disciples to also be obedient to the law and remain in Jerusalem a few more days. Remember, he'd been with them for 40 days. He was telling him to remain there for a few more days and um, receive the promise. If you want to learn a little bit more about the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, I suggest you read Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 through 21. Um, what's cool about this feast um, is that it was during a harvest time. It came after first fruits. And as I said, you were to number um, 50 days. It actually came after Passover, after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then after First Fruits. And I'll talk about it later, but the Messiah fulfilled 
all of those um, feasts through his death, burial, and resurrection. He was the Passover. He um, also became the first fruits of the resurrection. And then we see in Pentecost, which as I said is a is a harvest time um, feast or celebration, we see that instead of reaping crops, physical crops, or in addition to reaping physical crops, they actually reap the harvest of souls on that day. And 3,000 people accepted the truth, um, believed the gospel, and were saved on that day. So just to wrap it all up, Pentecost was most certainly, or the Feast of Weeks was most certainly observed after the resurrection. Yahusha the Messiah was resurrected, as I said, as the first fruits of a greater resurrection that will happen at his second coming. After his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples for 40 days. He tells them to stay in Jerusalem and wait a few days more for the promise. Not surprisingly then, about 10 days later, they and many of the Jews who were in Jerusalem for Pentecost, which means the 50th day, received the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let us move on. That's just one example. We're going to go over many examples. Next, um, Paul. Most people rely on Paul's writings when they're going to make the argument that the law is done away with. But he's such an interesting study because over and over again, not only does he extol the law and its virtues, but there's evidence that he actually observed the law. Um, he continued to do so throughout his ministry. So looking at Acts 18, verses 19 through 21, it says, And he, they're talking about Paul here, came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry a longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Okay, this is Paul we're talking about. And he's saying he must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Clearly Paul kept the feast days. He was willing to leave a group of people that he was ministering to just to make sure that he was in Jerusalem to fulfill what I read earlier in Deuteronomy 16. There is a commandment that was over all Israel, all the males had to appear in Jerusalem for um, the feasts, or th for those three feasts, unleavened bread um, and Pentecost being included. Okay, Acts chapter 18 and verse 4, again we're talking about Paul, says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now, why would Paul if he believed that the law was done away with, be in a synagogue every Sabbath. If he really believed the law had been done away with, he didn't need to be in a synagogue every Sabbath. He could be out shopping. He could be working. He could um, go relax somewhere. I mean, he could, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted to do on that day. But in observance of the commandment, he was assembling on the Sabbath, every Sabbath, it says here in Acts 18 and verse 4. Okay, moving on. Uh, Acts 17, verses 1 through 2, it says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Again, we see evidence that this was not a once in a while type of thing for Paul. It was his custom. It was his manner. He was in a synagogue every Sabbath because he was keeping the commandment to observe the Sabbath. And there it says he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now, I want to make this point that Paul, you know, some are going to say, well, the reason that Paul was in the synagogue every Sabbath is because he was a Jew 
and he wanted to be with other Jews. Or they'll say, well, he had t he wanted to talk to Jews, and he knew that he could find a group of them together on the Sabbath, and so that's why he went to the synagogue. I've heard that argument as well. But if you read Acts 17, verse 17, it says that Paul contended with Jews in the market daily. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, he was contending with Jews. He didn't need to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath day if all he wanted was to, to um, reason in the scriptures with the Jews or contend with them. He could have done it all six other days of the week. But again, in order to observe that commandment, he, would, he made sure he was in the synagogue. Um, and I believe he did this for two reasons. One, if you look at Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 2, it calls the, sa the seventh-day Sabbath a convocation. It's one of Yah's holy convocations. You look up that word in the Hebrew, just get a strong concordance or go on blueletterbible.org, you will see that... Um, a holy convocation means a sacred assembly and a reading. So in this, within the Sabbath commandment are two sort of sub-commandments, if you will, that you have to assemble with other believers and you are expected to read the scriptures. So that is why we see Paul doing that. The other reason he did that is he was following the custom of the Messiah. If you read Luke chapter 4 and verse 16... I'm going to turn to that very quickly um, in my Bible right here in front of me. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 says, and I am reading from the New King James Version. It says, so this is talking about the Messiah, Yahushua. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So again, Messiah during his lifetime, it was his custom, it specifically says, to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and to stand up to read. And so Paul is simply following what his master did and found himself in synagogue every Sabbath and made sure he was... Um, reading the scriptures with other Jews. So again, this is just other, we, we saw that Pentecost was observed after the resurrection. We see here that the Sabbath is also, was also observed after the resurrection. Now, what about the Day of Atonement? Let's turn to Acts chapter 27 and verse 9. This says, now when time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past. And it goes on to talk about how Paul, um, you know, basically warned uh, the crew of the ship that this was not a good time to be sailing, and they ended up getting um, shipwrecked and all sorts of other things. But um, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, how did he know that it was a bad time to sail? It says because the fast was now already passed. Well, what fast? Interestingly enough, there is only one time when the nation of Israel is commanded to fast, and that is on the Day of Atonement. Everyone has to fast or they'll be cut off from their people. They're basically not Israel anymore if they don't obey that commandment. And um, you know, a lot of people who are familiar with the law, they'll pick that up right away. But let's say you're not that familiar with it. I challenge you to take up Strong's Concordance again or go to blueletterbible.org and click on that word fast or look up that word fast. And you're going to see this explanation. It says, and I quote, the public fast as prescribed by the Mosaic law and kept yearly on the great day of atonement, the 10th month of Tishri, part of our September and October. And then it goes on to say the fast accordingly occurred in the autumn when navigation was usually dangerous on account of storms. This fast that was going on was 
the Day of Atonement, which happens in September, October. And, you know, think about it. That's sort of heading into winter time, And the seas become more tumultuous. There are a lot more storms. And it's just a dangerous time to be out in the open waters. And so here it was that Paul was aware of this. He was still cognizant of it. He was still thinking about the fact that the fast had already passed. Why would someone who doesn't care about the law, doesn't believe in the law, thinks it's done away with, even use that as a reference point anymore? So again, we see the Day of Atonement was um, still in observance after the resurrection. The disciples, in fact, observed it. Unleavened bread. This um, the Passover is a day, or really a time period. It's a portion of a day, or it takes place during a portion of a day. Um, the end, the latter part of a day, and then immediately following Passover, the next day begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a seven-day feast. So here in Acts chapter twenty and verse seven, it says, "And we sailed away from Philippi." after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. If you want to learn about unleavened bread, look at Leviticus 23 verses 6 through 8. But we see here again the disciples referencing these um, holy convocations um, and, and, and being cognizant of them and um, in fact observing them waiting, in fact, to travel until um, these days were passed. As further proof, let's go to 1 Corinthians verses 5, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. This is Paul speaking. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even... Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Let me pause there. He says, let us keep the feast. He's telling these believers in Corinth to actually keep the feast of unleavened bread. Specifically, he's, he's commanding, if you will, or encouraging, exhorting them to keep the feast of unleavened bread. But now he he um, makes sure that they understand the spiritual implication of it and don't just keep it in the letter. And so he, he goes on to say, keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All of these feasts um, have a greater spiritual significance. There's always some physical act that one has to do or maybe refraining from work. There's always something you have to do in the natural, but then there's always a a deeper spiritual implication to each of them. And unleavened bread, um, physically, you actually go through your house, you remove any leaven that's yeast or anything that's fermented, you remove that from your house as a physical act. But that's to remind you of what you are to do in the spirit, which is to remove um, sin, remove false doctrine, uh, remove pride, anything that is offensive to the most high. This is a time that you are to do an examination, do an inventory, look at your heart, um, pray that he would reveal to you what it is you need to get rid of. And so it's a time of reflection, really. Um, And so Paul was just reminding them of that, you know, get rid of the old leaven, get rid of that sin that you've been struggling with for 20 years, get rid of it. Now's the time to purge yourself of it, but keep the feast, he's saying. You're still to observe the feast because in keeping the feast, it reminds you in in a way forces you, I don't want to say that in a negative way, but it forces you to um, focus on these things. So, in conclusion, um, we see the laws of Yah are not done away with, nor are they nailed to the cross as some falsely teach. The Bible records that well after the resurrection of the Messiah, the apostles observed, number one, the seven-day Sabbath, number two, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, number three, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
number four, the Day of Atonement. All of these are listed in Leviticus 23 as the Feast of Yah. They're not in the Ten Commandments, um, but they are all throughout the Old Testament. They're also referenced in the prophets, and they're referenced even um, in prophecies of the future, you know, uh, Revelation and Zechariah and Jeremiah also reference these um, feasts and their sort of deeper spiritual meaning. So, again, a lot of people rely on Paul or try to twist his teaching uh, to say that the law is done away with. And so I wanted to just pull out a few scriptures showing that Paul held a very deep respect for the law. And, it is, and, and the things that he said were 100% incompatible with somebody who believed that the law was somehow evil or wrong or something that we should turn away from. So let's begin with Acts 20 and verse 23. Paul says, And when they had appointed him a day, I'm sorry, it's not Paul speaking, they're speaking about Paul. Quote, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Yah, persuading them concerning Yahusha, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. I actually um, want to read here the whole passage. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 28. And read verses 17 through 23 so that you can get the um, context of what's going on. I mean, we see in this verse here that people have come to Paul's house and he's persuading them out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. So Acts 28 and verse 17 says, And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, Though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Then they said to him, We neither receive letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. So now we're in verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of Yah persuading them concerning Yahusha from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening so what's going on here Paul's been accused by the Jews in Jerusalem of breaking the customs and um, you know I guess breeding sedition against the nation and um, they hand him over to the Romans, whereupon he appeals to his rights as a Roman citizen. And um, so he's sort of in limbo here. And they say, well, actually, we want to know what you believe, because everything we've heard about this group that you're associating with, um, that is the disciples, you know, we've, we've heard nothing but bad things. And so they basically appoint him a day, give him a time to come and um, explain himself. And what does Paul do? Paul, as always, decides to persuade them about the Messiah. He wanted to prove that Yahusha, who, you know, most of you out there in YouTube world call him Jesus, but his Hebrew name is Yahusha, um, he wanted to persuade them that this was, in fact, the Messiah. How did he do that? Paul used the law of Moses and the prophets. He did it from the Holy Scriptures. Understand the law of Moses and the prophets, that's the, your whole Old Testament. In other words, Paul 
he didn't rely on miracles he didn't rely on philosophy he relied solely on the law because usually when that's this is a whole other topic but when you refer to the law in the bible actually we're not just talking about Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Usually when they say the law, it's actually the first five books of the Bible. That's really what the law of Moses is. So 